So, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak here. It's a real honor to speak at this event. So, uh, this talk is going to be about the question of stability for the Kerr family solutions. So, let me begin by uh, reintroducing the, the object that we are all here to, to honor today. And essentially, I would just repeat what um, Armand Nicolai already said um, much more eloquently from the, the book of Chandra Sagra. So, the, the Kerr family of metrics um, is, if you want, the most general stationary axisymmetric uh, family of solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation that contain uh, a black hole region. Mm -hmm. So, this is a, a characterization of the family. And the family is determined by two parameters, which we we'll call mass and specific angular momentum, we we'll call them MA. And actually, the, the existence of a black hole region requires that uh, A in absolute value be less than or equal to M. And these remarkable solutions discovered by, by Roy Kerr are explicit. You can write them down. And uh, in particular, one way of writing them down in suitable local coordinates is uh, as the expression written here. So in particular, the case A equals zero is the, the celebrated Schwarzschild solution, which I guess uh, paper appeared in 1916, it's already discovered in, in 1915, as we heard in the last. So this is the object of study. This is the object that we are honoring today at this conference. Um, so this is a nice family of explicit solutions of the action equations. But of course, in, in general relativity, like in any theory of mathematical physics, uh, the goal is not simply to enumerate explicit solutions of the governing equations, but what we really want to understand is generic dynamical solutions. Okay, that's what we really want to understand. So, the importance of explicit solutions arises from the fact that their properties may be um, shared by the properties of generic dynamical ones. And in the context of celebrated Kerr solution in general relativity, if you want, its importance, its fundamental importance, rests on the expectation that we very much believe, which is that generic astrophysical systems will collapse to black holes, and the exterior of these black holes will settle down asymptotically precisely to a member of this family of explicit solutions with the parameter A less than This is, if you want, why from the point of view of physics, we believe these solutions to be valid. So, as I said, this is an expectation, this is something that we believe, something that we, we want to be true. Well, if this is to be true, then in some sense a, a precondition for the validity of this expectation is that, so forget about complicated astrophysical systems, stars, etc. Let's just look at vacuum. So if what I said previously, this widely held expectation is true, then the following statement better be true. If you look at vacuum spacetimes, which initially at quote time zero are very close to a member of the Kerr family, then they should stay so for all time. For all time from the perspective, let's say, of faraway observers. And moreover, they should asymptotically settle down to a nearby member of the curve arm. That is to say, um, forget about generic astrophysical systems. All right? If this is going to be true, then it better be the case that vacuum spacetimes, which initially are close to the curve metric initially, those, they better stay close, and they better 
as he felt in fact, back to a member of the Kurd family. Well, this is precisely the problem of stability of the Kurd family. We hope that this is true, but it remains a conjecture. But it's a conjecture that one can state very, very precisely. And in fact, it is a conjecture that one can draw. So I, I will <laughs> use the blackboard a little bit. I hope it's not technologically problematic. Uh, in order to draw the statement of, of this conjecture, which may sort of help getting through the, the words which are written here. So, uh, these, these pictures will be sort of understandable if you know the basic sort of language of Penrose diagrams. If you don't, then you can just think of it as a suggestive picture, but nonetheless it's, it's, it's very useful for understanding precisely what, what this statement is. So, first of all, let me draw the curve solution before I draw the conjecture, and <coughs> so the curve solution, so drawn in the sense of Penrose diagrams, I'll draw it like this. So I, I think of the curve solution as a solution that arises from initial data. So from this point of view, initial data is maybe a little bit strange because I'll take this global perspective that the initial data has two ends. Well, we'll dispense with this perspective later on, but bear with me for a second. So, initial data from this point of view, all right, will have two asymptotically flat ends, so this is sort of space at time zero, but it's topologically, it's not R3, it's R cross S2. Okay, so this is one asymptotic flat end, this is the other one. Every point is actually a sphere, but okay. my drawing skills aren't so great, so we'll draw it like this. So this is data, and then you should think of the curve solution as the unique solution of the Einstein equations that arises from this data. Okay. Of course, that's not how the curve solution was found, but you can think of it like this. So let me draw that. And most of you here know that the picture looks like this, where this is an asymptotic boundary at infinity called null infinity. Well, of course, there are two ends, so there's another null infinity. Okay. And, well, null infinity has a non trivial past. Okay. Um, rather, it, its past has a non trivial complement. This is what we call the black hole region. And these points are precisely the space-time events that cannot send signals to future null infinity. And future null infinity is, of course, just a, a mathematical abstraction for far away observers in the radiation zone. So this is Kerr. Uh, of course, somehow, when, when thinking in terms of the initial value problem, then by causality, if you only care, let's say, about this part of the space-time, okay, then I don't really care about this data here. That's to say, this part of the space-time is completely determined by this part of the data. So, when, when thinking about current initial data, I actually will think about sort of this kind of data. In fact, I'll typically think about initial data that crosses the event horizon north of the bifurcation sphere. Okay. So for me, actually, current initial data is this. Okay. And the current solution is everything only depends on this. So, if you want, this problem has nothing to do with two asymptotically flat ends. Astrophysical systems, of course, <laughs> they don't arise from the development of initial data with two asymptotically flat ends. So this is the curse solution. 
drawn. So now let me draw this conjecture. So this conjecture says the following, okay, this is current initial data. Let me look at the initial data for the Einstein equations, which is very, very close to this stuff. Now we all know that even the question of finding data for the Einstein equations is not trivial because data has to satisfy the so-called Einstein constraint equations, etc. But you can certainly find and rationally entertain the space of all initial data that are sufficiently close to current data. <laughs> so the question is very simply, now evolve this data under the Einstein back equations, what happens? And the statements of the conjecture are the following. So statement one is that again, you will get a black hole space-time. And what I mean by black hole space-time is that again, you will be able to talk about an asymptotic boundary called null infinity. And this will be complete. That's to say, observers at null infinity, they will observe for all time. Right? But the past of null infinity will still have a non-trivial complement, some region like this. Okay? And this boundary, which I'll call the horizon, will be regular. Okay? So you, you, can, you can think of this as sort of the most basic statement that whatever I get, there will still be a black hole. Moreover, so that's statement one. Okay? So if you know the notation of Lorentzian geometry. So space, statement two is that in this region, the geometry will be globally close to that of a, the member of the Kerr family that you put in. Okay? That's to say, uniformly in time, it's measured by all observers that move into here, the space that will be globally close to the Kerr family. So you should think of statements one and two together as the analog of orbital stability in dynamical systems. Okay, I have a stationary solution. I look at nearby solutions. Well, they stay close to that stationary solution. Okay. <coughs> but actually, statement three of the conjecture is actually we have asymptotic stability. That is to say, the space type will asymptote again to another member of the curve line. Now, what does that mean? Because when you, when you say asymptote, you have to start talking about time. So asymptote simply means that if I look at the foliation like this, okay, so a foliation that goes to the horizon and to infinity, then as I move up in the time of this foliation, the solution will approach another member of the curve family. So you can think that you're originally perturbing what you think is the current metric with parameters A0 and M0. Okay. You will approach here another member of the curve family. All right. And these parameters will be near but not equal to the parameters of the solution that you thought were perturbing. So this last statement is the question of if you want asymptotic stability of the family. So this is, this is the conjecture, and you should compare this to, in some sense, the only context for the einstein vacuum equations where such a statement is known, which is in the context of Minkowski space. So Minkowski space is known to be stable, precisely the analog of this sense. This is a celebrated theorem of Christopher and Klein. So let me just make one comment, actually, about um, this conjecture which is the following. Uh, you might tell me that, well, we don't know any of these statements. <laughs> Why am I so greedy? Why am I conjecturing all of them? Why don't I just start with the first and then, once I've done that, go on and conjecture the other and the other? Well, one thing that we know very well from the proof of stability in Kosky space is you have to prove all three if you're going to prove anything. That is to say, um, the einstein vacuum equations, because of the nature of their nonlinearity, if you cannot understand what you are approaching asymptotically, 
you cannot understand even orbitals. Okay. So this is an important point to keep in mind. All right. So this is, if you want, the, the one of the main open problems in classical general relativity. Um, so again, a meta statement from mathematical physics. If you want to understand a nonlinear equation, nonlinear equation like the Einstein vacuum equations. Well, you first linearize, right? Everyone knows this. Uh, so, if you cannot understand the linearization around a particular solution, then forget it. You are never going to understand the, the nonlinear theory in the name of that solution. Well, so there is a, a linear version of this conjecture, what I'll call linear stability of curve, which is the following. So. Maybe I'll just draw it here, since I've conveniently drawn curve. So linear stability is the following. Fixed curve. This is curve. Okay. Fixed curve. And on the curve background, consider the linearized Einstein equations. All right. Consider the linearized Einstein equations. And again, consider initial data for the linearized Einstein equations, whatever that means. It's quite complicated. You can define initial data here. Okay. And ask yourselves the following question. So question one, is it true that, so consider initial data for the linearized function and solve the linearized function equations. Okay, so again, these equations are well posed. You can solve. So uh, statement one, you'll see why I put it in parentheses. Is it true that no, the, the solution exists everywhere here. Okay, in particular everywhere in the exterior, because this is really what we're interested in. Well, I, I put number one here only because, in some sense, that is the analog of the first statement of this conjecture, the nonlinear case. But I put it in parentheses because, well, this is a linear equation. Linear equations, they can never blow up in finite time. Okay, so. Whatever, you don't have to do any computation. General nonsense tells you that, well, the solution will in fact exist ever. That's okay. That's not a conjecture. That's, that's a statement of fact. So statement two is that the solution of linearized gravity, it's what I'm calling delta G, this stays uniformly bounded everywhere in the exterior. Okay? So this is precisely the analog of statement 2 here. Okay? Think of this as orbital stability. And finally, statement 3. So if I again, I look with respect to the foliation here, it in some sense allows me to move in time both along the event horizon, not infinity, and in the interior of the interior of the exterior, so to speak. Then uh, delta G is going to approach a linearized solution of the curse of uh, um, rather <laughs> will approach a linearized curve solution. Because of course this linearization of the ancient equations around curve, in particular it will see the nearby members of the curve factor. Now of course because this is a linear statement then an alternative way of saying this is that, well, there exists uh, delta A delta M such that delta G minus this linearized curve solution decays to zero. Okay. But I've stated it in this way because it's more clear to see the connection with statement 3 here. So this is, if you want, uh, the statement of <coughs> linear stability for the curve found. And again, maybe we can compare it at this point to linear stability in Minkowski space. So uh, I mentioned the nonlinear stability in Minkowski space. This is actually a 500 page proof by Stadler Kleinerman. Linear stability of Minkowski space, the analog of this problem, is actually well known from before general relativity or special relativity were ever written down because somehow this
statement in the context of Minkowski space would reduce to completely classical statements about <laughs> the wave equation that we all know and love. Okay? The equation written down by D'Alembert. Okay? So the analog of this statement in Minkowski is, if you want, trivial. So in, in, in the Kerr case, this I stated as a conjecture. So what, what may be surprised uh, to read that this is uh, a conjecture, that's to say that uh, not, not only is the question of nonlinear stability of Kerr not known, but even the question of its linear stability is not known. Um, but in fact, uh, just to drive this point home, uh, one, one shouldn't be surprised that the problem of linear stability is not understood, given that nonlinear stability is not understood. Because actually, were the problem of linear stability understood, then given what we know about nonlinear stability of Minkowski space, let's say given the insights of uh, Christoph Lutter and Kleinerman, we would actually be well on our way to proving the nonlinear stability. Because this phenomenon of stability, at the end of the day, it is a linear phenomenon. It is governed by the properties of, of linearization. Okay. Now, needless to say, there are some subtleties, as I told you before. In the case of Minkowski space, the, the linear statement is completely classical. The nonlinear stability is proven in a, in a 500 page book. But nonetheless, uh, there is a very good understanding nowadays of, of that. So it's really the case that the fundamental obstacle for this problem is linear. There's only one caveat that I might as well say explicitly, which is the following. But, well, when I say understanding the linear problem, you actually have to understand slightly more than just what I've written here. Uh, namely, not only, and this concerns, if you want, statement three, not only should you understand that the linearization asymptotically settles down to a linearized Kerr metric, but you have to understand that quite quantitatively. That's to say, you really have to understand the rate at which it settles down, and you have to be able to bound that rate from initial data quantity. And again, the reason should not surprise you, because the way one proves nonlinear stability is you should somehow think of um, uh, solving it, if you want, naively by iteration and by linearizing, and then somehow accepting the difference between the linearized behavior and the full behavior as an error term. And now, if you want to be able to integrate that error term in time, then you better understand not just that that error term decays, but that that error term decays at a suitably fast rate. So, uh, with that caveat that actually, ideally, one wants to show a, a very quantitative version of three, uh, if we could understand this, we would be well on our way to understanding uh, the full nonlinear problem. So what what is understood? So well, this this problem has of course been very very well studied, and there are many many brilliant insights onto onto this problem. And in particular, the so the very concrete statement which has been understood for some time now uh, is the statement called mode stability. So what is mode stability? Well. Uh, to understand this, let's recall that it's been shown by Tukolsky, one can extract a decoupled wave equation from the full system of linearized gravity, now known as the Tukolsky equation. And moreover, this equation, it formally separates. So what does that mean? That means that you can entertain the study of solutions of this form. Okay, that have the explicit omega phi and explicit but complicated theta dependence. Okay? And 
somehow R dependence, which is governed by a certain ODE in R, where the ODE depends also on the frequency. So you can entertain the study of these solutions of the Tukolsky equation. You can say, let me just look at these solutions. All right. And you can say, OK, I'm going to look for such solutions of precisely this form, that at time t equals 0 have finite energy. And moreover, such that the imaginary part of omega is not real, let's say possible. So, if such a solution exists, then because that is precisely the time dependence, and there is a non-trivial imaginary part, then as time goes to infinity, the solution will grow, in fact, exponentially. So, these type of solutions, if they exist, they're known as unstable modes. And in a truly remarkable paper, uh, Bernard Weikman showed that, well, su such solutions do not exist. So this non-existence statement is known as monster. So this is this is what in some sense we know about the linearization of the Einstein equations. Now, somehow un unfortunately mold stability is most useful when it is false. Because well, but if mold stability is false, then linear stability is false because this solution is in particular uh, a, a solution of the initial value problem with initially finite energy, which exponentially grows in time. So, if mode stability is false, then that's great. You have disproved linear stability. In fact, uh, this has been used more recently to show that higher dimensional cousins of the Kerr solution uh, are unstable. But unfortunately, the, the opposite implication does not follow. That's to say, mode stability uh, being true does not imply that linear stability is true. It does not imply that solutions of the initial value problem for the linearization uh, are bounded, let alone decay in time. And, well, I mean, <laughs> there are many reasons why that's the case. But let me just uh, sort of uh, say, somehow the most fundamental reason, which is essentially the following. Well, given mode stability, then one expects that solutions of the Cauchy problem are a superposition of infinitely many modes of arbitrarily high real frequency. That you can sort of write the solution in terms of real frequencies. This is precisely the statement that if you want there are no, no uh, the, the, there are no contributions from the, the upper half plane of the, of the, of the complex plane in, in, in the frequency sense. So, I mean, even say the statement sometimes <laughs> very difficult a priori, but let's pretend that that's what it's done. Moreover, uh, let's pretend that actually you don't just know mode stability, you know a certain refinement of mode stability, but which is in the same spirit, so I'll, I'll give you this also. Which is that um, somehow this refinement of mode stability is telling you that yeah, each real mode individually is well behaved. That's somehow what mode stability is. If, if I fix the frequency, then the solution is well behaved. But what it does not give you any quantitative insight is, is in, in some sense, what, what is the what is the bound on the behavior? as the frequency parameters go to infinity. So it, it does not really give you any insight whatsoever about what's going on as the frequency parameter goes to infinity. So uh, without this type of information, then even completely heuristically, it does not suggest any statement about the superposition. So in particular, it does not even suggest that solutions of the superposition be bound. So it does not suggest even the weakest type of stability, namely orbital stability. Right? Because that means something quantitative which has to come from somewhere else. So uh, as a matter of principle, it's really, in some sense, does not really tell you anything about it. Nonetheless, we'll see that it, it is a very useful statement to have. Okay. So 
there's no question about it, but it's since it's not the most difficult part of the story. Okay, so um, so such is the case for the system of gravitational perturbations. Uh, but actually, all, all these issues, if you want, uh, they're already present in what I'll call, paraphrasing John Wheeler, the poor man's linear problem, which is just the study of the linear homogeneous scalar wave equation on a fixed curve up. So, that's to say, again, this is curve. I'm interested in the following problem. This is the wave equation on curve. Classical covariant linear homogeneous wave equation. Okay. I want to impose arbitrary initial data. This you can think of this as the graph of initial data, sort of clumsily superimposed on this picture. I want to evolve this initial data, and I want to ask the same questions that I asked previously. Okay. That is to say. Does the solution remain bounded in terms of initial data? Does the solution decay in terms of, let's say, this coordination? Okay. So it turns out that the study of this equation is much easier than the study of the full system of gravitational perturbations, even given the existence of a decoupled to Kolsky equation for the lab. So one might think a priori that, well, after all, gravitational perturbations in some sense is governed by one scalar equation. It's not this equation, it's a much more complicated one, the one written down by the course. But it's, it's, it's actually, in fact, particularly in, in this paragraph here, that even though for fixed frequency you have a decoupling, uh, to understand in the context of gravitational radiation this problem, you have to remember the full system. This is very important. So, Somehow, the scalar wave equation is actually simpler in a fundamental way. So let me tell you a few words about this problem. So the study of this problem, in the sense that I just described, was initiated by Bo Wald and K and Wald in the Schwarzschild case, A equals zero. And what they showed is that, yes, uh, general solutions of the wave equation on Schwarzschild, uh, they remain uniformly bounded for all time in the exterior, all the way up to the horizon. And that latter point is important. Okay. In fact, in the Schwarzschild case, that latter point is the only difficulty in this problem, but it was difficult. <laughs> so, uh, in the past 10 years or so, there has been intense work in try to understand that statement, just that statement, for the Kerr case, and moreover to show that not only are solutions bounded, but they in fact decay in time, and moreover they decay in a quantitative rate that, in principle, is good for non-linear application. So, uh, many people have contributed to this problem, most recently Anderson is here actually, and uh, Lou. Uh, I've worked on this with Igor Rodnyansky and uh, Tohani Anu and, and Tataru. So, this problem has recently been uh, definitively <laughs> resolved in, in the full sub extremal range of curve parameters. And the statement is, in a nutshell, yes, uh, everything that you want about this problem is true. Okay. So, I actually, it seems on this slide, I've called this C, so let me do that now. So, if you look at solutions of this problem on curve, then yes, solution remains uniformly bounded with respect to initial data. And moreover, it decays, it decays in fact at a rate in time that you can, you can quantify, it's polynomial, and the constant depends on the strength of initial data. And moreover, not only does Psi decay, but all derivatives that you could ever want to take of Psi, they decay. And they decay not just far away from the black hole, they decay everywhere up until and including the horizon. 
Actually, you can go a little bit inside. Okay. So that, if you want, uh, is where we stand with. Um, that is where we stand with the, the problem of scalar perturbations on black hole backgrounds. So um, let me just say one word about the proof and then move to a certain epilogue I want to make. So well, one element of the proof is in fact precisely mode stability. So this proof uses mode stability. Uh, you don't need it in the case where the rotation parameter is much smaller than m, but for the general range you need it. In fact, you need a slight refinement of that statement, which is due to uh, graduates at MIT, Yakov Schlappendorf. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, this element of the proof, even though it's somehow the simplest, it's also the one which is still wrapped in the most mystery. So people who have never looked at Whiting's paper, I really encourage you to do it. It's really remarkable. It's very, very algebraic. And it would still be very, very interesting to understand why that statement has to be true. Okay, it's in some sense the most fragile part of the whole proof. But the most difficult aspect, if you want, of, the, of these type of statements is understanding quantitatively the high frequency behavior. And if you want, this in turn is related to well-known physical properties of the space-time. So this part of the proof, you actually have a better understanding of what's going on than in, in the appeal to most of it. And, well, very briefly, what you have to understand is the celebrated redshift effect. Van Horizon was first discussed uh, explicitly in, in the paper of Oppenheimer Snyder. Uh, quantitative capturing, quantitatively, if you want, capturing the obstruction to decay posed by closed photon orbits. This is a high frequency phenomenon. You don't see it when you fix the frequency, so mod stability does not care about this. But you certainly see it when you try to understand solutions of the initial value problem. In fact, it is essential that the dynamics of geodesic flow near such uh, orbits be hyperbolic. Otherwise, you would not get polynomial decay, you would get logarithmic decay on the basis just of high frequency phenomena. And all hope for nonlinear stability would be gone out of it. And the third point, which is really remarkable, is that the difficulty of superradiance that you really have to understand now in the high frequency limit, it is disjoint from the obstruction of trapped malgenesics. So, Remarkably, all of these, if you want, three elements, they degenerate as you approach the extremal limit. So this theorem is much harder to prove the closer one is to extremality. So in the remaining two minutes, let me tell you what happens at extremality. Because this, in fact, was a big surprise, at least to me. So remember, the black hole range of Kerr is when A is less than equal to M. So the case of equality is again a black hole. In fact, to the future of this type of a Cauchy hypersurface, the picture is exactly the same. That's why I've erased everything there. So this is the so-called extremal case. So this is again a black hole metric, but there's something special on the horizon. And what's special is that the surface gravity is zero. So what that means is if I have two observers, observer A and observer B, and if you look at the signal that observer A sends to observer B at horizon crossing time, and you measure the redshift, which observer B measures, well, there is no redshift at horizon crossing time. It degenerates. And you should remember that this is a bad thing, because the redshift is a stability mechanism. So of course, these extreme of black holes, they're often considered in high energy theory, but in recent years have been increasingly discussed in astrophysical context. So, very, very briefly, uh, there's a natural question to ask, sort of, does the statement that I proved uh, with Rodnansky, does it hold in the extremal case? So, I had given this question to a former student of mine, uh, uh, Stefan Sanitashis. And, well, the first statement that he proved, if you want, was maybe not so surprising, he said, well, let's just look at axisymmetric solutions. This way we don't have to think about super radiance. There's actually an interesting story 
with superradiance, which has to do with the degeneration of the sort of relation of the last uh, the last point here, but I'm not even going to talk about that. Just think about axisymmetry. Okay? So what he showed is that yes, for axisymmetric solutions, you have the exact analog of what I proved before in the sub extremal case. At least if you don't try to look at the horizon. So don't look at the horizon, look everywhere else. You have the exact one. No surprises. But then he showed something else. Um, he showed the following statement. For generic initial data, then if I look at the horizon and I look at the translation invariant derivative transversely to the horizon, this is not decay. And in fact, if I look at the second derivative, this blows up, polynomial. In fact, you can write down the coefficient, which rate blows up. So in this sense, for scalar perturbations, extremal occur is linearly unstable at the horizon itself. Note that this type of instability can never be detected by mode stability. Mode stability but not stability. Note also that this has nothing to do with superradiance, so this holds in particular for axisymmetric solutions. So, um, well, that this I promise you is the penultimate slide. So, um, key to this instability result is a conservation law of the horizon, which had never been noticed, but it's very, very simple. So I can't resist the temptation of writing it down. Here it is. If you look at this quantity and you integrate it on a sphere here in extreme occur, this quantity is conserved on the horizon. So if this quantity is non-zero here, yeah, it will be non-zero for all time. And if you want, this, um, this conservation law is at the heart of the instability mechanism. So since uh, since then, various people have worked on this in particular. You can relate these conserved quantities to the well-known Newman Penrose quantities at, at null infinity. Um, so let me just end then with the following uh, more recent work. So uh, more recently, uh, James Lucchetti and Harvey Real, they've shown the, the analog of this instability for the Tchaikovsky equation on extreme occurrence. Okay, so the same phenomenon is exhibited by Tchaikovsky equation governing gravitational perturbations. So, if you want, extremal curve is linearly unstable to gravitational perturbations on the horizon. So, needless to say, it's a completely open problem to understand the precise effects of this instability for the nonlinear dynamics of the Einstein vacuum equations in the neighborhood of, of extremal current. So, this is a very interesting surprising direction that, that arose. So let me end here. I apologize for going to the problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>